Ladies and gentlemen, back today, we're going to be talking about computational neuroscience, what it means, uh, as well as some other topics today, because we're here with none other than Dr. Thomas Trappenberg. He is a computational neuroscience professor, uh, professor of computer science, to be exact, at Dalhousie University, somewhere up there in Canada. Is that right? That is right, on the beautiful East Coast. Uh, where whereabouts is um, is the university? So it, uh, it is in the province of Nova Scotia, uh, and it's the, the town is Halifax, which is the capital of Nova Scotia, and uh, just above Maine. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have some of my favorite artists come from there. I know my my f uh, favorite is Buck sixty five. He's a he's a hip hop guy, and he's from the the small town of Sackville up there in Nova Scotia. So got a love a lot of love for those people up there. Uh, There's a lot of music here, so it's uh, that's one of the great things here. Yeah, is that do you think it gives off a creative vibe the area up there? Because you're not originally from there, you're from Germany, so you find it kind of nice with the nature. Oh, oh yes. No, here yeah, there's there's a long tradition here of of um, music. Uh, uh, there was a lot of filmmaking here, uh, and so there's a lot of creativity here. Yes, that's good to know. That's good to know. But you are on a different journey. You are into computational neuroscience. So take me through your academic journey. How did you get interested in taking you know the brain and the computer and kind of mashing them together? Right. I actually I started uh, studying uh, studying physics. Uh, I did my PhD in particle physics, so I had not much to do with it. But I came here as a postdoc and got really interested in neural networks. So this was uh, early '90s, and um, and then I got interested in what they have to do with the brain. Um, so I started studying that, and I went actually to Japan to uh, the Brain Science Institute there. Uh, to study more more neuroscience, and this is how I got into computational neuroscience. What year did you go to Japan, and what was your experience like? Uh, so this was in '97. Uh, I went to Japan, um, and I went to a very new institute called the Riken Brain Science Institute, which was very cool. I was also in a wonderful uh, lab there. There's a guy named Sunichi Amari who actually did this kind of AI stuff, which now everybody's so crazy about. This is already in the mid '60s, so it's, wow. it's actually not even that new. Yeah, he's uh, and it was a, a wonderful. This is an absolutely fabulous guy, and uh, yeah, this was very interesting. How long did you stay in Japan? Uh, I stayed a little bit over two years in Japan, and then did another two years in Oxford in England, and. And then uh, we had kids and thought, you know, the place here is wonderful for family. Yeah, but at least you got to sow some wild oats and travel while you could, while you're young. And now I, I, I get a little old myself, I think, traveling. Uh, it's fun, but it's not for <laughs> every day. Yeah. Did you have to travel a lot extensively with your research at the beginning? Because you, you've been to other places as well. Yes, I mean, um, part of it is really going to conferences and meet other people. Um, and I have to say, I find this very inspiring. I haven't been traveling uh, that much over the last uh, couple of years because I got interested also in politics. Uh, another story, but uh, I find so now I'm uh, trying to travel more, and it is very inspiring. You know, you have to you have to see other people, you have to talk to other people. Um, I had collaborators also at different places, and there's so much you can do over over internet. An interview like this works perfectly, right. but uh, all other things, if you really want to brainstorm and uh, just to 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 think about uh, different type of things. Yeah, sometimes I need to be there in the room with people. I need to smell you in order to you know really get down to the. So, uh, but you also, you look, you, you've been working in this field a long time. Have you seen a lot of advancements come in and, uh, and make your job easier? What are you excited about as far as advancements in the field of computational neuroscience? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I should say that I so so I, I studied computational neuroscience, and I'm quite interested in computational neuroscience. But I also worked over the last uh, few years in machine learning. Uh, I, I'm here now in the computer science department, and most people are really interested in that. Um, so I do a lot of uh, uh, both, and and which is I think interesting because we made a lot of 
recent progress in artificial intelligence, or at least it is perceived more that we did a lot of uh, uh, new advancement. We did actually, as I said, most of these things were actually known quite a long time, but our computational power uh, of the computers, they increased so much that we can now do really things uh, which we haven't done before. So there's a, I have to say at the moment, there's probably the most hype and most uh, advancements are in the field of AI. Um, however, uh, in, in computational neuroscience, what happened over the last few years is also that there were very big uh, um, projects. So, for example, in, in Europe, they have the, uh, the Blue Brain project um, and in similar in the States, uh, a big brain project. So there were very large projects. And I think uh, what is now exciting is just trying to we have a lot of new data and really to make sense of the data we have we have again, to catch up, to really trying to understand what they mean. And I think what for me the most exciting is, is to realize that actually what we now think about artificial intelligence, that this is very different than the brain. So I am actually now going back and saying, you know, it was interesting to study how we could build learning systems and the brain is learning. And I think that's one of the, of course, uh, very important parts that the learn uh, that the brain is plastic, that it can adapt to things. But now realizing that actually these AI methods, they look very intelligent, but are they really? And the brain, there's so many other mechanisms which we haven't even really understood uh, right now. How can we say that a, a computer is intelligent if we haven't figured out for sure what it is that makes us intelligent? Right. That, that's right. Uh, ab absolutely. You know, I, I don't know really what intelligence is. Uh, I uh, anyhow, but the what what we can, uh, you know, some people at the moment argue that uh, these new machines, these uh, GPTs, so the, the new transformer type of, of things, they can pass bar exam much better than we do. They can, you know, write essays probably much better than I can. But uh, is this really intelligence? And that's, I'm questioning this because I know that the brain is made in such a different way. Uh, there are some aspects which, uh, which we, we do capture in machine learning, um, that of what is called representational learning. So we learn uh, how we build uh, in our brain filters which can look for certain things. And so there are certain aspects which are certainly captured but many others are not captured by our current AI system. I would say some things that the brain does that also actually connect to things like limbs or hormone systems could be counted as intelligence while a computer wouldn't, it'd be, you know, it'd be a long time before they could figure that out. So let me, so let me ask you this. What about how many neurons in the brain and how close are we to, to mapping them all? Because I just re heard a study. I had a guy on the program who helped with uh, mapping out the fruit fly brain. Now, how many neurons in the brain? How long before we figure them all out? Well, they're around 10 to the 12 uh, uh, neurons, whatever this number is. I mean, it is huge. What this big project I mentioned before tried to do, they tried at least to rebuild parts of the human brain so for example a hypercolumn so which is a part of a of the cortex just a small little one millimeter square part of the of the of the brain and really trying to recreate everything uh the the fly brain was something recently too yes that we figured a lot of things out at least how these neurons are connected however we we actually we we know for example for for many years already it's like little worms they have a few hundred neurons and we know all of them and we know how they are connected but we still haven't figured out you know how it really works so i'm actually quite dubious that we you know learn from uh, just trying to get all the facts um that uh, jeff hawkins is actually the the inventor of the uh, the Palm Pilot, uh, if you remember this, many years ago. Um, and he had a good point. He said, you know, in a few uh, hundred years when we are uh, probably all gone and, and some aliens come to to uh, the Earth and they look around and see all these streets, but well, they don't know the, what the streets are. So what they do is they, they go and measure everything, you know, what is the particle size mm -hmm. and how many particles there are mm -hmm. and all these kind of things. But, um, uh, and, and then... 
you know, they measure everything, but still they have no idea what the, what it's for. So I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in we have to understand what we are even trying to solve and, and think much more, uh, you know, that, of course we need facts. We need, we need uh, but we need good hypothesis first to know even what to look for in the data. And, and I think this is lacking at the moment. We have a lot of data, but less really hypothesis what we should look for. Mm. Are you one of these people in science that sort of thinks that, because uh, I know you like nature and stuff, that we should uh, maybe uh, be a little slower with some uh, aspects of technological development? Or do you are you all in for genetically modifying us so we glow in the dark and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, the, the, a very, very nice question. That's a very good point. Of course, as a scientist, I want to know. I want to go forward. So I don't want things to stop. However, I think we the, the, the problem is that we are not ready with our society. So, for example, there was recently with uh, the Transformers, there was actually a call from very prominent scientists calling for a halt of, on our development, um, uh, saying, like, let, let's stop. I mean, these machines getting so good that they will probably soon take over the world and uh, will kill us all. Um, I don't think that's the case, but... What is true is, and, and I signed this letter, not to hold research, but to make us wake up to, to that we have to address now new challenges. So, for example, we can build, uh, of course, we can now make fake images and videos. And because humans are very, you know, susceptible, if you see something in a video or, or a picture, you really believe it. So we have to have laws. We have simply to have laws that if you do this, you know, sure, it would prevent doing it, but at least we could punish people if they uh, misuse these kind of things. So I, I think I'm, what I'm very scared about is that we are not prepared within our society. I think there are a lot of opportunities. I'm, I'm also very excited that with these technologies, we can do things, we can solve things, we can you know, I, a few years ago, I actually co-founded um, a robotics company, which does weeding. So, you know, on a farm just to get a bit of reed, weed. And if we can do this physically, it's much better than using chemicals. Indeed, the chemicals have a problem. Um, and anyhow, so we can, we can solve a lot of things with these new um, kind of approaches. But we can also, it, it can also be misused and we have to be prepared as a society to react to that. We have yet to rein in the internet and social media as a thing that needs to be regulated. We've yet to uh, do sugar. We've yet to do chemical fertilizers and, and pesticides and herbicides. We have built our society on all these archaic bad ideas. And, uh, and then to just to switch out of them is really hard, right? Um, so, but look, you, I mean, you also are writing books, is that right? How many books have you written? Well, I, I've uh, written this uh, book on computational neuroscience, which actually is the third edition, which just means I haven't gotten it right yet, so I try to <laughs> improve it always. Uh, but I also, as I said, I, I, I work a lot on yes, machine learning, so I wrote another book of machine learning. And I lo uh, wrote a little local book on uh, green politics in Nova Scotia. Very different. But <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, you can't go away without talking about that. What, in what interested you first about getting into politics, especially getting in with the Green Party up there in Canada? So, uh, as you mentioned, I'm actually from Germany originally. I grew up there. Uh, my father was a meteorologist and uh, even uh, working on microclimates. So when I was, you know, maybe 12 or 14, he told me about what a one degree difference would do. So people think it's fairly new that we talk about, you know, I, I have been talking about this uh, for, you know, over 40 years. Um, we actually, you know, science predicted this over 100 years ago. But, but anyhow, so we were talking about severe weather and all these kind of things. Secondly, because I was brought up in Germany, it was very important uh, in our education system that, you know, after the war, that we, that we were educated that if we find that there's something wrong, we have to stand up and say so. You know, a lot of bad came out of too many Germans just, no, no, it's okay. It's not so bad. Yeah. It doesn't really... I heard, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
uh, I think it's a combination of this. So I just, at some point, I had to do something. In particular, uh, we just came back to Nova Scotia. My, my kids were small, and I said, you know, now it's all about the future for my kids, and I, I need to speak up. So this is why I ran uh, for the Green Party, of course. I Again, for me, it was more common already being familiar with these kind of ideas. And so it was fairly natural. Natural. It was also, I mean, it was clear that it was very hard to be getting elected. Indeed, at the beginning, it was not my goal. It was just my goal was to have a platform at least to talk about. Um, at the end, I wish I, I really wanted to get uh, elected and I wish we would have a better electoral system. Actually, it's not just the electoral system. It's a, a better way we could, as a society, um, get people who know about things to, to, to try to address the problems, like the, you know, how to address new technology and things like that. And I think um, most of politics, unfortunately, is now all about, you know, being elected. And to be elected, it is all about um, being, uh, well, reaching people in a certain way, not necessarily what is good for our society. Yeah. I had an idea today that we could use technology and get rid of these old systems of justice, for instance. You're like, you don't need judges if if you could give the the um, what happened, all the evidence, and just give it to everybody and let everybody vote. You can see the video of the guy robbing the store. You can decide for yourself. And then we as a people can vote on everything. It could be like a true democracy instead of representatives and, you know, corrupt you know, uh, uh, bureaucrats and aristocrats, right? Yeah, that's yes and no. So we know that we know actually, for, for example, um, we have uh, decision support systems in, in, in medicine, uh, which can actually make really good decisions. Indeed, you can show that these system can often actually make better decisions than humans, uh, you know, uh, presented with certain kind of facts, what is the likelihood to have a certain disease? These kinds of things are good. Mm -hmm. However, and then this is where the system lag. There is no idea about you know what as a society we want to achieve and and what are um, you know what is right and what is wrong. And 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 this is something which is uh, which we haven't tackled with with uh, with technology yet. And I think actually you know with these new technologies, yes, we we don't anymore have to do the nitty gritty just uh, get all the evidence and see what is the likelihood of having um, a certain disease. But we can concentrate now on and saying, you know, what should be the right actions we should do or what, what should we do with uh, technology? So I think we still need humans, but there are a lot of things where technology can be used in a very effective and a much better effective way than, than humans. And, I, and we, the discussion needs to go on and on. There's also, some, I wrote an article the other day about chat gbt and all the other the bard the uh you know all, all of them that are out there they all are doing this thing where they're respecting religion and i think that's a slippery slope where they won't say anything bad about a, a, ma a magical carpenter that lived a long time ago um that's 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 making we're teaching them the biases of humans isn't that isn't that a little upsetting in your professional opinion <laughs> Very much so, very much so. Uh, this is not the solution. Um, I think actually we were discussing now at the universities how we react to these kind of uh, chat GPT type of things. There's actually uh, these kind of uh, um, models can now program much better than our than I can. And so so why you know we don't even have to really teach any more uh, programming. And I'm I'm a big fan of it. It's saying, well, if we have a tool which can do these for us that is good but what now we can we can free up time and let's use this time to teach actually our students much more about morality much more about you know thinking about the global aspects thinking about our society so i'm i'm very excited you know there so are, we should use technology but but really uh think more right but there's a caveat to that is that if we you had this great idea with the weed picking robot you put the robot out in the field and it picks the weeds for you. well that's great too and that's gonna put somebody out a job where hypothetically they could actually do the thing that they want to do you know enjoy time with their family stuff like this but we have to get over this point of capitalism which says no no he he has to pay for his you know time or whatever i think robots are going to take a lot of people's jobs and there's not going to be a lot of uh way to get around that except massive socialized stimulus 
Well, Chris, we have a lot of work. That's not the problem. You know, we could have, we could use many more people and, you know, help elderly people and to do a lot of other things. Uh, there was this great story I read uh, about, you know, so someone is um, visiting a country and the president showing off the, the new uh, project to uh, dig a canal and they have uh, spades and everybody is just shipping and building this, this um, you know, canal. And, and then say, well, why don't you use uh, backhoes? And heavy equipment to say, well, but we employ all these people here. Then I said, well, if you want to employ all these people, why don't you use spoons? You know, it, yeah, it's yeah, not it's about. True. It's true. Like, look, yeah. But, but we should, what, should, what yeah. are they going to do, though? And if, because crime will go up if these, if, if mass unemployment, look, it's taking the jobs of actors are striking, you know, logistics people are striking. I saw a robot waiter. I've seen a robot delivery man, um, lawyers, doctors. All, all these, all these. This is like a, we're talking about a massive displacement of jobs. It's, it's a little. What? Well, look, how about we don't have to work at all? I like. So it. we have the. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know what the problem with it is. You know, we are not. I mean, the work is not. First of all, I think there are jobs which we unfortunately can't automate. But the, the ultimate goal would be that we should work less. Um, I remember uh, a thirty-six hours work week in Germany, um, and and now we are back at forty, and and well, probably. Uh, actually, now, especially in the States with several jobs, uh, also starting here in Canada, um, it is not the goal is not to have jobs. The go goal is that we, we can live, we can live comfortably and and we can solve that. As so you, I'm not scared about it at all. And I indeed, mean, we have so many jobs which are not done because we're doing things which a, a machine now could do. Yeah. I mean, you see the instruments in the background. I'm a musician, so I'm chronically and happily underemployed or unemployed most of the time. So I'm, I'm not for work. I'm just pointing out that there will have to be some kind of socialist revolution to come along with that freedom, like th that that are we, we're not supposed to be out scrounging for money in order to pay rent, you know what I mean? That if there's no avenues of revenue making and it's just a utopia, then why are we still burdened with that, that yeah. structure? Well, we did, I, I did think about it because, um, uh, especially for our platform. So the, the idea is we have to find a way that actually the robots will work for us and getting paid right. for us. Yeah. So why should we do the work, you know, send your robot to work and then, he gets the paycheck. Tax, tax the robots. Tax the robots, indeed. I like that. Because if not, it funnels all the way to the top and these rich guys get richer. I don't know if that's going to really work. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. We have to find a way to also redistribute then the wealth, that not the one guy who has this company with all the robots makes all the money. Right. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely key to it. Yes, absolutely. I like it because you came out with computational neuroscience and we just drifted right into politics. I love it. Um, <laughs> So tell me about some of your recent papers. I've been looking at your Google Scholar. What's some of the papers that you've been uh, excited about? I, I saw a paper on label-free monitoring of self-supervised learning progress. Uh, and this was like a big deal. So can you talk about that one? Yeah, sure. So, so one of the problems we always had, we have not enough uh, label data. So we, what we are trying, actually, this was in the context, we are trying to make models of the ocean. Uh, actually building maps of the ocean because the oceans are are changing very rapidly and actually we don't have very good data uh, you know we know more about the surface of mars than than the the ocean floor so we are trying to do that and uh, we have starting to have a lot of photographs but they have to be annotated by humans to saying what they are and then we can teach our our neural networks um, so what we are trying, and, and there were a few uh, quite nice new uh, methods thinking about how can we actually do some training uh, just by itself. So it, uh, the idea is that you show it an image and then you distort it and then the, the network learns maybe uh, that it is distorted and learns something about the system. And then we need much less uh, label data, uh, data to really um, uh, do the training. So that's that's a big project we're trying you know to work uh, for the ocean. 
Um, but I do also many other things. And what I'm quite excited about is one of my uh, fairly recent PhD students is now a professor in psychiatry. He's actually a psychiatrist. And uh, with him, I do a lot of computational neuroscience. And what really excites me there is that we are now getting also to the stage where we hopefully find some way to understand uh, things much better. M uh, you know, mental challenges are, are widespread and uh, we all wish we could do there more. Uh, we in particular are working on some uh, models of, of um, some mood disorders like bipolar. And there were some some recent findings where we now know certain kind of neurons uh, work a little bit different. And uh, so we're finding more and more that now, so applying our, uh, trying to apply our, what we learned from computational neuroscience more to, to really trying to understand uh, how, you know, the brain works in particular also how, how it might dysfunction uh, that this leads to something. So I think this is also very exciting really to, to think about um, there's actually a fairly new discipline called computational psychiatry, which uh, tries to use uh, computational uh, methods to to help to understand uh, the kind of mental illnesses and diseases. That's, that's really cool. I mean, and you also mentioned that uh, uh, people are doing data entry by hand. Is that one of the biggest caveats with making advancements at the moment is people have to sit there and do images and say, well, it's black and it's got a dog in it and yes yeah this this was uh, i mentioned before that i uh, actually these these kind of networks uh, neural networks uh, are quite old but really also the advancements we made uh, actually the breakthrough in computer vision was made because google went out and said we have all these images how about everyone in the world you know if you if you have find a few minutes you know go through the images and tell me what you see in them so they created a very big data set called ImageNet. And, and this was used then to train the networks. So having really a lot of training data has always been the bottleneck. Um, and so there are some, some ideas how you use now much more unsupervised or self-supervised learning, where, for example, you know, two networks compete each other to, to accomplish a task. And just by this competition, maybe it finds a good solution. So th th there's a lot of thought, you know, how can we, how can we uh, train networks without, without human input? Mm. You also work with uh, complex biological data like plankton. Is that right? Yes. Can yeah. You, so, can you so describe this ocean. one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the ocean, ocean science is actually a big thing in, in Nova Scotia. Uh, Nova Scotia is a peninsula and actually it has the uh, biggest ice-free harbor on the East Coast, so it was always important for that. And of course, the fisheries. Um, we, we are not far from uh, the Grand Banks uh, uh, out of Newfoundland, and so fishing uh, was always important. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, relation to science. Uh, we are a fairly small town, but actually within ocean, uh, oceanography, it is actually one of the, the big centers in the world for, for ocean science. So we do, therefore, have a lot of people here interested in that. And, and as I said before, we are, um, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot to learn about the oceans. And it is rapidly changing. It's actually scary how it changes. Uh, you know, on the surface, it looks nice and blue. But uh, go and dive. And I have some diver friends. And they're saying, you know, last year it looked totally different. So, so we are trying to, to measure this. And one of the things uh, was that we, uh, a local company made a, um, a holographic camera, so which tries to make 3D images from little, uh, um, you know, in the ocean and can therefore see a lot of different type of planktons. And again, we want to, we want to measure it. We want to see how it changes and, and really understand also the, the ocean ecology uh, much better. Uh, this had to do by it was, had, you know people had really to look at all these images and but now we can automate these things so we can really count now uh, many many you know thousands millions of pictures and can see how many different species are there and how many of each type and these kind of things. Holographic camera sounds expensive, vaguely <laughs> vaguely expensive. <laughs> I haven't bought it, so I, I couldn't tell you. I'm, uh, I'm not selling them. So Sounds like something <laughs> you'd rent, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but you also are working with what predictive modeling of lithium response in bipolar disorders. Is that true? You've been researching that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so this is what I a uh, little bit mentioned uh, already. So this is with my my former student, um, uh, uh, who uh, Abraham Nunes, who is uh, a specialist for for mood disorders. And so this, uh, what I mean, so in bipolar, there is some medication called lithium, which uh, some people respond to and some others don't. And the problem is that uh, it might take years to see, does it really work or not? So if we could predict if uh, lithium is helping the people or not, then this would speed up uh, helping them a lot. So this is, this is one area we are working with. And what we found, or what other people actually recently, first of all, found, is that certain kind of neurons in a specific area of the brain um, respond differently for people who respond to lithium and people who don't respond to lithium. And, and this is what we are trying to understand. First, we are, we are building models which try to build this little area of the brain called the hippocampus, um, and particular an area called dentigyrus. Anyhow, so we, we are trying to to build models of this. We are trying to understand how we could maybe test uh, what these kind of different uh, uh, neuron uh, activities do, and therefore maybe test uh, if, if people would be responsive or not. So it's still a, a long way to go, but I mean, it's really exciting that we can finally, you know, here's one example where we finally find something where neurons really react differently if people respond to lithium or not. And, and certainly this is a part then of the problem, which, you know, where bipolar is probably, uh, you know, which contributes to bipolar. There, there's still so much unknown um, and, and being able to, you know, see now some, some light that there's something which we can study is actually quite exciting. What, and, and how is the, is obviously it's, it's sort of a black box, but if you do computer modeling of, small parts of the brain, do you think that you get accuracy or are there still some unknowns? So, so these models are really trying to rebuild the brain, first of all, so the small parts. At least, you know, you don't, we, we don't necessarily need all the neurons. We can, we can build simplified models of it. But what we want to understand is if we make changes to parts of this, what are the consequences, uh, you know, on, on downstream uh, parts or how it would learn or something like this. So there's a lot of things we can test on kind of smaller models. Of course, they have to be then verified in often animal models or or trying to uh, do you know some other type of studies. But as compute so computational neuroscience helps by often interpolates like here's an idea how the responsiveness of of some of the cells, would change behavior. So it is it is actually a computational method I found really helpful to to kind of connect what we know on the cellular level and on the behavioral level. And and this is where so it's just part of of course of the whole research uh um my uh former student does there but but I think it's an it's a nice way of uh you know being on the cutting edge that we can connect things uh, which others don't so much see. So you also are an educator. You just said one of your students. Uh, what's it like f with the students these days? Are they? Do you find that they're, you know, real excited about the field? What do you, what do you see? Are they very bright? Or do we have a future, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, it's actually, a, uh, I, I find a big problem. So during COVID, something happened. You know, a lot of things came to the forefront. And this was very, very interesting for me. It was, first of all, it was very hard to teach online, just to speak into a black box because most people don't have the camera on. Uh, so that was very hard. And, and again, I, what I mentioned already before, it is something else. If you, if you speak with the people in person and you, uh, you said this too, um, on top of that, I think our educational system is a little bit misguided. We, we, we're trying to, you know, test all the time. There are quizzes. Uh, there, there. You know, we haven't started teaching anything, and we are already giving quizzes. Um, and we, we, how we evaluate and what we value sends the signal. You know, you have to know everything right away. 
And I think that's wrong. I, I, I hope, you know, there are students who are out there who, who want to learn. And, and so give them time to learn. Um, so I think at, at the moment, it's actually very, very challenging. Uh, there are students who are really want to learn. Many students really are there to learn. But then we teach them, well, look, we are just looking at grades. And you have to make sure that you have just A plus grades. And, and a lot of uh, students have just concentrate on that. How do I get a good grade? Not what do I have to learn or what do I want to learn? And, and that's, a, that's a big problem. So I, uh, with all this experience, um, also my, my, my kids actually were uh, studying at the same time. So they were on the other end and I saw how, uh, how they were stressed out with uh, the online teaching. Um, so since then, I, I really rethought how I teach and I, um, it, I have a lot of fun now to work with students who want to learn. And I'm very sure that they understand that, look, we are now sitting here in the course together 12 uh, weeks, and I'm, I'm happy to work with you. Uh, if you really want to learn, you have to ask questions, we discuss, but don't come, and this often happens, uh, two days before the final and say, oh, what do I have to learn to get an A+. Plus? And then they are surprised, first of all, that they fail because they thought they would get an A plus because many, many of them, you know, just automatically get an, seem, seem to get an A plus. Anyhow, we have, so I think we have a lot of challenges. What percentage of the students are like that? Um, unfortunately, uh, a fairly large percentage. So my, my grades are often now bimodal, you know, even people get good ones or, or they fail. Um, it is... As I said, something something happened that we have at the moment, at least uh, I, I think it's it's fairly common now that students also have this attitude. Even if they don't get an A plus, you know, we are we are getting a lot of complaints, and uh, uh, you know, I it's it's easy to show them. Well, you can get an A plus if you know the things, but if you don't, not well. But, it's not a memorization game, right? You have to be passionate yes. in order for uh, the stuff to stick in your mind and and have a connection to it, right? Um, yeah, very true. That's actually a big part of it that we are even w the type of things we are putting in a quiz. It's more a memory test, and and this is very important for me that I'm trying not to give a memory test. I'm trying to ask them questions which we really show. Have they gotten the idea or not? And and that's important for me. Just did they get it or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming. Will you come back and do it again? Oh yes, this was fun. All right, thank I, you very much. I, I had fun too, and I learned a lot. And uh, I think the AI thing will just get more and more exciting over time. Uh, uh, before we go, quick question: Robot police, yes or no? No. <laughs> Why? Why? So there are certain things, as I said, there's a lot of things we should automate, but uh, we should have compassionate, compassionate police, policing. So, uh, and this we haven't mastered with uh, robots yet. Okay. This is an important question. I always ask all the, my experts the same. Oh. Um, all right. I want to thank Dr. Thomas Trappenberg, uh, University of Dalhousie up there in Canada, Nova Scotia, beautiful um, area. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you again and uh, stick around. We'll talk right after this. So thanks for coming, everybody. Bye.